thank you everyone for joining. Um, my name is DJ and I'm a final year medical student at Imperial College London um, and I am the leadership uh, portfolio lead at Becoming a Doctor um, and I'm delighted um, to be hosting this panel today with such esteemed speakers. Um, so the theme for today's um, panel is leadership in uncertainty or leadership in times of uncertainty. Um, and I think uncertainty is something that we come across time and time again. Um, in medicine, we have clinical uncertainty. So when you're dealing with sort of the undifferentiated patients, when someone comes in and we're not sure what's going on, what the medical problem might be. Um, but also more recently during COVID, uh, that's obviously uh, led to a lot of uncertainty um, with regards to how, how hospitals are run, um, a lot of cancellations, a lot of reorganization. Um, and also just generally sort of as human beings in life, we have major life events during our careers, which are obviously very, very long from the age of 18 all the way up to through consultanthood. Um, and we often change careers, we take time out, things happen. Um, so also hoping to talk a little bit about navigating that and throughout all of this, um, touching on how do we develop the skills um, to navigate through these times um, and also uh, help lead our teams um, in whatever in whatever shape that might be. Um, so without much ado, I'll, I'll hand over to yourselves and uh, if each of you want to um, first introduce yourselves and take it from there. Um, I'll start. Um, so uh, you were talking about people who change jobs. I've got loads of jobs, so I'm going to try really quickly to tell you what they all are. So firstly, I'm a respiratory physician and I specialise in lung disease. Um, which is really niche, um, but I find fascinating. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, my leadership roles uh, generally uh, focus around education. So I've been a supervisor, a training programme director. I was the director of medical education at my trust, and now I'm a deputy dean, and I look after the South West London Trusts and all the trainees with, within those on behalf of HEE. Hello, Sevier. Um no, I have a number of... That's all right. I said you'd gone for coffee and given where you're sitting in Chelsea, you may well have gone for coffee. Um, my other no, jobs sorry, are... Sorry, okay. No, no, it's all right. Sorry, I'm mid, mid flow of my introduction. So I have a load of leadership portfolio jobs. So I look after the Dean's National Leadership Leads Group, which looks after leadership development for, for postgraduate medical trainees. I look after the flexible portfolio training uh, pro program for uh, HE with RCP so that allows medical trainees to do one day a week throughout their higher training so doing something else so QI, informatics, education research so really interesting program it's, it's fascinating I wish I had it when I was training um, and I've also until recently been the clinical lead for physician specialty recruitment so that was an incredibly challenging task um, and I'm just stepping down from that because during lockdown I decided to change one of my jobs and from the beginning of August I'm going to be the Lineker Fellow at the Royal College of Physicians so I'm changing to a different employer as well um, and I'm going to be looking after all the college tutors that do all the work essentially for the College of Physicians um, and I'm going to stop there before you all get really bored and exhausted and hand over I'm not sure whether to Aaron or Sabir I'll let them argue about that. Aaron. I think we're going in alphabetical order so over to you Sabir. So just doing introductions, Dr. Singh. So just a sort of 30 seconds or so introducing yourself, your role um, and leadership positions that you, you, you hold or might have held. Sure. Um, well, um, you should have started with, you started with Joe, I just can't compete. So, um, um, but, so I'm, a, I'm a physician, I'm a jobbing physician um, uh, in respiratory medicine and critical care uh, at the Royal Brompton Hospital and Chelsea and Westminster. And I'm also part of the faculty of the School of Medicine of Imperial College. And, um, and actually, my roles are really threefold. And they are uh, clinical, um, they are education, and heavily involved in medical education, undergraduate and postgraduate education, and thirdly, research. And that's really me uh, summed up in three different uh, pots, uh, all of which... Um, uh, are a balancing act, but they're all pleasurable. I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, and now, Dr. Figueroa. Hi, yeah, thanks. Thanks, DJ. And so, am I, please call me Aaron. Um, I'm, a, I'm a GP by background, um, 
although I can't contest that I practice much anymore, occasionally, very occasionally. Um, I've, uh, my, my main job is that I'm the medical director for all of Bupa UK and Bupa Global Health Clinics. Um, so uh, Bupa as an organization is primarily insurance, uh, but also has a lot of provision for Cromwell Hospital. Uh, and then we have 60 health clinics across the UK, some internationally as well. Uh, and so I'm responsible for risk management of governance, healthcare provision, general practice, and um, all of our clinic facing uh, offerings. So whether that be with our corporate clients or uh, dermatology, uh, some some respiratory, musculoskeletal medicine, a lot of a lot of uh, different types of offerings within our clinic space. Um, I have keen interest in alternative models of. Uh, delivery of primary care in particular, which is even more pertinent now in, in COVID. So video consultations and remote consultations, asynchronous and synchronous consultations. Um, I'm a big believer in value-based healthcare um, and changing the way in which we uh, pay or, or pay or strategy in, in management of healthcare delivery. Um, and I have research experience in, in those fields um, and, and also in public health. Um, so th those are my interests, uh, and those are those are that's my primary role, uh, and that's mainly in, in in healthcare leadership within the, the, the organisation that I work for. Cool, many thanks, Aaron. Um, so just getting on, just now that everyone uh, now that we all know each other, um, just moving on to sort of the first topic. So your roles um, and the most recent period of uncertainty that we've had, so COVID. Um, how have your roles? Um, whether within the NHS or outside of it, um, and leading the teams that you all lead, how has that changed um, with such a massive shakeup that that was COVID? So once yeah, I was thinking, it. Severe yeah. should stop because he was yeah. totally at the coal face. I, I'm, Aaron, you may have been too, but I definitely wasn't. So I think Severe sure. should lead the search. Sure, I can. Um, I can do that. Um, it was the most interesting time. Um, as a clinician that I've ever experienced in 25 years or more as a clinician, um, uh, just because of the intensity of work. Um, but uh, key points for me in terms of, you, you've asked about leadership. Well, you know, we're all leaders um, when we run teams. Uh, equally, we're leaders in terms of education uh, and we're leaders in terms of um, learning. Uh, and actually, those three things were really crucial to me. There was a, there was a fear and an excitement. Um, the fear for yourself, your own um, uh, health, um, the excitement of uh, being part of a, an enormous team that were all focused on one thing, which is actually just trying to um, save patients' lives. And it was literally a conveyor belt of patients coming in uh, on... We've never seen so many ECMO patients. We became the second busiest ECMO centre in Europe um, in the space of a week. Um, and uh, so that was one aspect of it. Uh, it was that, that need to step up. Uh, the, the other important bit on reflection was that people around us, you know, we were, uh, there were cardiac surgeons, senior consultant cardiac surgeons and, uh, and, and cardiologists who uh, were repurposed into the role of SHOs, uh, and you were leading a team of extraordinarily experienced and um, uh, expert people. Ex um, uh, but they were filling in a role, and there was that anxiety that you had to overcome very, very quickly of hierarchies. Um, I have to say, the, the the level of camaraderie, people wishing to do the right thing, uh, and coming to you uh was was really quite humbling but also it was uh, it was a recognition of the need to step up so every patient was so vulnerable and they were being looked after often by people who were out of their usual roles and my leadership role actually came in ensuring safety ensuring that there was standardization of care and then also the feedback element of it you know actually commending people for great work or recognizing a problem and actually then trying to tra you know, spread that. Um, but alongside that, there was also the education you know, of our own ICN respiratory trainees, uh, 
students which you know who were outside and and, and I felt very responsible uh, for medical students who were not able to get into this and yet they were missing out on one of the most extraordinary experiences of anyone's life and so you know we set up as DJ knows we set up um, online teaching a lot around COVID just to try and give people a sense of what was um, going on within the um, the front line so I think those are my uh, key experiences of, of leadership. It was trying to uh, manage a huge workload, uh, trying to standardize practice, uh, reassure uh, the shared learning with those who were out of their comfort zone, uh, and also ensuring that um, there was a, um, a learning element to it for everyone who wasn't able to be there. I'll just make one final. It was a very weird sensation of being absolutely full on you know, 14 days on, on day in, day out on ICU and then being at home because you weren't told, you know, you've, uh, at where it was actually quite sunny and the roads were quiet. And uh, I had a bit of difficulty just coming to terms with that myself, actually. Uh, I got loads of papers written, which was brilliant, but, but I actually felt guilty that I wasn't in there, although I wasn't meant to be in there. So anyway, those are, those are my reflections on leadership during this time. Aaron. Shall I go next? Okay. Yeah. Um, so my experience is actually completely different to Severe's and 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 you'll probably make sense as to why. Um, as an organization, we actually closed a lot of our services because some of them were not deemed essential to deliver, except obviously the, the uh, Cromwell Hospital, where I was involved in negotiating the contracts with the NHS so that we could support and patients and alleviate some of the burden um in, in in the national health service and quite rightly um so some of our routine services we closed and we deemed it not necessary to deliver and we shifted a lot of our clinical attention to supporting other organizations in the best way that we could and um, so some of the key things that changed in my leadership capacity um were actually we uh, uh, got in contact with the government to see if we could support them with respect to their COVID testing capacity, because clearly they were struggling at one point. Um, and then my team were actually involved in developing the home testing kits. Uh, and then we worked alongside Deloitte, Amazon, Royal, Royal Mail, um, in order to kind of push how many kits that we could deliver to different people, get those websites up and running. And in particular, what the government lacked actually was a designated clinical unit that could simplify the instructions that would go out in the packs to try and reduce the failure rate of those test kits being taken at home and uh, there was a lot of debate of whether it would be worth it about home testing kits and whether the failure rate would be too high um, but we just simply didn't have the diagnostic capacity when i say we i mean the country didn't have the diagnostic capacity that germany has for example to be able to facilitate the ramp up of testing that we needed so we thought we had to go down that route um, so I'm really proud to say that although we didn't see, um, you know, I wasn't involved at the coalface and, 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 and hats off and respect to people who were, um, we had a lot of involvement in other things that had a lot of effect in different ways. Um, more locally, our health clinics had to uh, adapt uh, new risk management policies. So now that we have started to see patients, I should say that uh, our primary care kept going clearly because that needed to be, but I'm talking about things like health assessments that were not necessary at the time, uh, which, which ceased. Um, but we set up a virtual delivery service for our primary care offering in a matter of four weeks, which is unprecedented given the amount of red tape and information governance and information security, GDPR, all those issues that you have to ordinarily surmount. Um, we had a from organizations like the CQC and the regulatory bodies and to try and help us get to that point, which was, you know, it, it, which was very, very special for, you know, a lot of big organizations to be worked so fluidly and so quickly, which is something that had never happened really before. And um, so that was, a, that was a great thing. Um, and I think, you know, there was a strong need for clear leadership, effective leadership, you know, having regular communication channels with your staff, having all hands calls, there was a lot of worry about, you know, BAME, ethnicity risk of our staff who might be working and 
you're looking at the PHE report and how we can implement those changes. So, so much that goes on behind the closed door that affects a, a lot of people. Um, so that was that was something that I was deeply involved in. And the last thing I would say is that, um, I, and that's something that I'm continued to be involved in is uh, supporting the Department of Health and Social Care in their thinking uh, round tables of how to get businesses back up and running, but do it safely. Um, and we're seeing a lot of organizations that are, um, you know, a lot of organizations that we support are doing very, very regular testing uh, because they can afford it. And some that are doing uh, random testing and there's no, currently there's no homogeneity and there's no clarity about what is the advisable way to test people that are asymptomatic, symptomatic and so on, and then bring them back to work safely. We're adhering to government guidance and um, there's a lot to be improved in those areas. So I'm involved in that think tank as well. Um, and uh, those are the main things that we've been involved in of late, but it's it's been a whirlwind. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, we will continue to be involved in those areas. Thank you, Irene. And Jay? Um, yeah, I'm going to take a, a sort of system approach to what I'm going to say, because what I ended up doing, apart from homeschooling three children and trying to do virtual clinics, which actually were great, I was... And uh, I've always been a big fan of tech, to be fair, but I've found it really useful uh, doing clinic mm. telephone. The only awkward thing about it is trying to get an interpreter in at the right time and everybody getting on at once. So that would mm. I would say that there are some issues still to iron around, out around health inequality, not not least that some people don't have a computer or a mm. phone. Um, but I'm sure, you know, over time we're going to work all those things out and I'm sort of looking forward to fixing them. Um, I think in my leadership roles, what happened was that um, we rapidly realised that we were going to have to redeploy trainees en masse from their programmes uh, into, as Sevilla mentioned, uh, just like the consultants into ITU, into COVID wards. You know, we were moving ophthalmology trainees in to look after patients on medical wards. This is a massive exercise um, and uh, being responsible for those trainees, but not within the organisations that they're working means that you're not really uh, leading so much as influencing the leaders within them, the trusts that are actually delivering the care. And so that requires quite a lot of delicate negotiation and also understanding who your key stakeholders are. So for us as deans, those would be the directors of medical education and all those trusts. So we ended up literally having conversations with them as a group once or twice a day to check in as to what they were doing how they were going to move trainees, how they were communicating to the trainees who, as Severe mentioned, you know, would have been fearful for their own health, but also feeling like they were going to start again in a job that they hadn't thought about or thought they were ever going to have to do again, you know, from medical school foundation years as a massive uh, undertaking. But, you know, the, the good thing about educators is that we love um being flexible and we love finding solutions to things. So that's a general uh, I think a general case um, that people who are interested in educating are interested in improving things. So very rapidly, all of those trusts shifted into gear, you know, doing amazing induction programs for these um, trainees to make sure they felt fully equipped um, to go in and work there within these systems, setting up buddying, setting up all those small communications, those tiny loops, you know, well below where Aaron uh, has been operating in think tank level but you know that communication had to help happen everywhere so there's a great amount of dispersed leadership going on at the same time there's a very command and control leadership coming from up here in HEE and NHS coming down to us so we had this information to transmit and then taking that out into the ecosystem and then getting their feedback bringing it back up again and up so you know I just spent my whole life doing this basically which is why actually I'm really comfortable now talking to people over screens, um, which again is is a is a real change for all of us, isn't it? So I think you know it is it's a time of uncertainty because everything was changing the whole time, and I think um, that's what uncertainty is about. It's about change that you don't understand. You're not sure how it's going to pan out, uh, and I think we're still dealing with that, aren't we? We still don't quite know what's going to happen. I'm thinking right, my children are going back to school in September. What's that going to be like? How are they going to be? How are we going to survive the summer? It's currently raining. Um, so all of this is going to continue. And actually, the whole phrase around it being a marathon, not a sprint, came out quite early on, actually. 
Um, and, you know, Severe's comment about doing 14 days straight, you know, that ha had to happen at that time, but that's not going to be sustainable. So we really have to work out how to bed in for this for a little while. And I think the other thing that I would um, just pull out from that is that the system's working really hard to restart care for our chronically unwell or acutely presenting patients. So, you know, my patients were great. They're all on furlough. So I was ringing them all and they're like, yeah, my occupational symptoms have disappeared because I haven't been at work. It's like, yes, great. Yes. Like, we, call, we start calling it a reverse challenge test because normally we try and challenge people to their workplace to see if they get ill, but now we're just taking them out. So um, so it's, it's we're going to, we must write that one up actually. Yes. Yeah, I like, that. I like that. Um, I like that. You know, so, so law of unintended consequence, but, um, you know, it brings up all of those issues around how are we going to manage the restart? What are we going to do about shielding trainees in the longer term you know how are they going to complete their training will their career look different you know I've read lots of blogs from trainees who are saying actually how on earth am I going to become a plastic surgeon if I can't go into work while I'm shielding all of that's going to come into play and I think you know this isn't this is just one part of that uncertainty and we all have to get better at admitting that we feel uncertain that we should get a panoply of views to understand the situation better and then come up with the best possible scenario, recognising it could change by the next day or even by the afternoon. And that's where I think people have really who, who can manage in that way have found it much easier than those who, who like structure and, and fixity. Um, you know, there's no right way to be as a human, but that's, I think, the reality that I've seen. May I just add a really important, interesting point to what Joe uh, Aaron has said? Uh, what, what's interesting, in, in three of us, here uh, you can almost get the whole overview of uh, from the top to to the coal face and 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 that's very rarely um very rarely happens in any single scenario and i think that could be part of why there is this disconnect uh between you know whatever type of trainee you are uh and not really appreciating the organizational uh, needs that were you know requirements um, uh, whilst uh, yeah, the, at an even higher level than that that sort of um, overview of what needed to happen which was uh, enough people to manage the huge surge of patients and I think this is fascinating for me and the other thing I will just say is that in innovation and technology uh, really were allowed to show themselves in a way that they've never been required to in such a short space of time so, you know, like Aaron was saying, and, and we were developing, I mean, at the Brompton, um, some of my colleagues uh, we developed a ventilator, a 3D ventilator uh, made out of nylon that could be um, uh, printed in less than a day. And there were going to be uh, a thousand that could be produced uh, in a day. Uh, and we were having, I mean, this is ridiculous. We were having conversations with the cabinet office, you know, in the middle of the night about um, whether this um, uh, could be pushed forward um, and um, uh, as it as it happened it wasn't because M MHRA uh, were uncertain about whether nylon the material that was going to be used uh, might get into the, um, the airways and so you know uh, extraordinary in so many different ways and I'm sure we've all got our own um, uh, little vignettes of something that we thought, well, I never would have thought that could happen. So fascinating, really interesting. I mean, just to build on that, so I think Sir is actually right, uh, absolutely right. And from a macro, meso, micro level, almost uh, the, the way we're discussing this. And um, I think there's, there's so many facets to this. And one thing that I've seen is that organisations can work well together when there's a necessity for it to, to happen. And that's something that we shouldn't necessarily forget when we, if and when we do come out of this. I remember having a conversation with um, the chief people officer of the Nightingale hospitals. Um, and he said, you know, we had a conversation and I said, look, you know, we're paying lots of our doctors who are not working because we're not conducting essential services. You need a lot of them. Why don't we do some contracting where we just shift them over to you, you know, um, and, and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, again, contracting, which ordinarily when you go through legal and all the indemnity and all the forever um, was all of a sudden very quick when it needed to be. Uh, and that's something we should always remember, I think, and, and when, when needs must and all. Echo that as well. And um, a lot of our trainees were 
going out to work in private um, provider organisations because that's where things were happening and approved for training by the GMC in I, you know, I was staggered because it used, you know, the amount of forms normally that would take and, you know, meetings and things. And it all just got done because it needed to happen. You know, there was no reason to stop those people's uh, training pathway if they were delivering the service that normally provides their training. Um, but um, obviously, lots of disruptions have happened to trainees. And we do need to be mindful of the fact that they're, you know, for us, we have a career. We're so fortunate, aren't we? We're in a point in our career where we can do what we do we we probably I think the three of us probably do like what we do and enjoy it and then we can pick other things pick up other things as we want to but people in training tracks don't necessarily feel like that and I think that they worked incredibly hard and they were so good at stepping into all these roles and rotors and changing how they worked um, and we I think we do owe them uh, a duty to make sure that their training is back on track um, over the next year or two to make sure that they get to do what they really want to for their future because it's everyone's future was kind of suspended for a bit wasn't it but I think for them it's going to be really critical to get that back up and running um, and I am definitely conscious that routine work is really not up to a volume where you can say you're going to be able to train everybody as you would do normally and that is going to need a lot of effort from people like me sitting up here thinking yeah. about curricula, but also people like Severe going, actually, what do these people need to be able to do to be able to train to work with me? Because we need to rethink that maybe it isn't right, um, yeah. which, again, brings opportunity as well as threat, doesn't it? Yeah. You have to have, and we ha we all do have, you know, um, meant so many patients um, were saved thanks to fantastic organisation, um, fantastic repurposing and that dedication um, uh, but also you have to have that humility which we all do have to recognize that um, um, it didn't always go well uh, it didn't all go well and indeed what we're coming into now um, is the reality of this post-covid um, complexity for training for education for people's you know people are tired as well and so you know we have to manage that and frustrated um, uh, behind the scenes, they won't necessarily mention it, but it might come out. You know, there's a there's a degree of end of termitis. You know, if, if I put it that way, and uh, and 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 why not? You know, for for um, but but you know, there's no euphoria here. You know, there were extraordinary things done thanks to fabulous organisational and refing. But um, but there's a you know there's an aftermath to this, and we have to manage it in a way that is realistic. But equally, I think we have to inject and this is where I think leadership comes in as well this is you know you have to be enthusiastic you have to show uh, as I said shared learning a joke you know a bit of um, uh, you know an interesting bit of research uh, a, a, a tip an experience anything like that can spark uh, that uh, opportunity to share experiences and, and and take people's minds off you know um, something that might be a slightly darker view Cool. So thank you very much, panel, um, for touching on that. Everyone at, you know, at different stages, um, as Arun said, sort of macro, meso, micro level, um, if I can call being a senior consultant at, at the Brompton, the micro level. Um, Stuff so, micro. Yeah, micro is good. <laughs> uh, just sort of moving on as we approach um, very quickly the, the end of our session. Um, so to there's a lot of people watching who are at different levels of their training so there's um prospective medical students um there's medical students in their preclinical years there's medical students in that towards the end of their clinical training like myself or, or newly minted fy1s fy2s um and other junior trainees um in terms of developing our leadership skills and in terms of the the vast array of opportunities that everyone here has taken use of in the positions that you've gotten yourselves into are those things that have just sort of you've just come about them is that something that you uh, decided on the outset and and how do we how do you develop foster and sort of develop and foster these skills or, or find find these opportunities um wow uh, so it's not something you know leadership is a term isn't it 
but uh, how, how how you um, uh, how how you make it contextual to what you are as a who you are as a person it is pretty tricky, and you only reflect on it maybe in a in a leadership course. And I, I would I would definitely recommend leadership courses because it it brings out and highlights those elements that you that are hidden in you, but you didn't you didn't know that you had. Um, the, the other thing I would say is that you should observe cultures, you know, uh, values, attitudes, behaviours, uh, particularly good ones, uh, in those who you're around, because you, you'll, you'll always remember that someone who is good will be, you know, this, others will say that. they say, oh, he or she was, um, was you know, taught me well, or this was done very well, they were very professional, or... Uh, and you might hear it from uh, from patients. You might hear it from other colleagues. So I think being observant of the kind of things that you think, yes, I think I would like to aspire to that, and then making a list of those things. And those are, you know, the usual things: that compassion, that professionalism, that sort of um, authority, but authority with humility. Uh, and and I think those are those are things that I've certainly taken from some of my uh, mentors over the years. Um, uh, and now I've been in a, I'm in a position to reflect on them more and, and hopefully be in a position to try and emulate some of that, hoping that others will actually gain from it. Whether or not they do, well, that doesn't really matter. But as long as you try and uh, you know, do that uh, and are conscious of what you're doing all the time, you know, any, any comment that you make, any bad comment that you make, uh, you need to be conscious of it. So those are my um, those are my thoughts. But I would say a leadership course is certainly worthwhile um, at, at any stage in trying to bring out some of those important cultures, values, behaviours, attitudes. I'll stop. Thank you, Joe or, or Aaron. I mean, would you want to touch on that or? Expanding on that, yeah, can you a, share on, on any leaders that you've come across who have influenced you during your careers? Yeah, I can I can expand on uh, say, similar things, really. What I would say is is just watch, observe, practice, iterate, repeat, basically. Yeah. So, and I don't, I don't, you know, leadership, I think, is, is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird word. I don't, I don't think it belongs just to heads of organizations or, or, or deans of organizations or whatever. I think ge genuinely, as, as cheesy as it does sound, I think everyone has some type of leadership attributes and should be executing some type of leadership in any role that they are in, especially in healthcare. And the reason why is I think that, you know, speaking from my own perspective, um, you know, leading the uh, uh, provision arms in, in Bupa, if I wasn't receptive to everyone else's leadership attributes, then I would be essentially blind to feedback and iteration and improvement. So, so I think it's important to watch other people, whether that be in a difficult conversation with a patient, with a colleague, with an external stakeholder, whatever that may be, uh, in, in negotiation, um, how they do that with empathy, subtlety, influence, cohesion, all of those, th all of those things. Um, and I think there will be times in any kind of career that you have in healthcare where you need to lobby for the interests of who you represent or your team, whether that be team or your um, hospital or your uh, DGH or your teaching organisation, I don't know, or your, uh, your representative body, whoever that may be. And I think the biggest skill that I can say is that, a bit like Surya said, is that you don't want to do that with blind arrogance and aggression. You want to do that with subtlety where people still come away thinking, actually, he did that in a very nice, he or she did that in a very nice way. Um, I understood their agenda. I understand what the points they're making. And how did he do that, he or she do that in a, in a way that didn't offend, but at the same time made their points in an articulate fashion. And I think that to me is the most important. And I've learned that from and I wouldn't like to list any particular names I think I've learned that from several people um, and I'm actually going to say Surya probably doesn't remember this but I was actually a medical student when he examined me in my paces at Imperial um, I do, I do and remember. So, <laughs> he was one of the so, best <laughs> oh there you go uh, so I remember several faces from my past track record I think that's important because there's little iotas of everyone who you might want to 
kind of get a patchwork and, and, and develop what you think is the best. I say you think, because you'll never be the best. I mean, you, you know, there's always improvement. It's my go, isn't it? You've, you've both said all the clever stuff. I mean, to me, leadership's a team sport. You can't just lead on your own. It, you know, there's a whole kind of, you can read about followership and stuff, but basically leadership is absolutely about making sure that people are with you on whatever journey, mission, whatever you're doing, even if it's just deciding where you're going to go and have a cup of coffee. And it's totally true that anyone can be a leader because you only have to see a load of small children bossing each other around a playground. They're all leaders. And for some reason, at some point, and I'm not still not quite sure when it is, that it gets beaten out of you that you can be a leader. I think it's a, during the first few years working in the NHS because then you sort of join this overwhelming machine and you get told that you can't do this and you can't do that. And I think, and then you're, you're tired and you're busy and you're learning. And I think it sort of falls a little bit off people's radar for lots of people. And I think for me, my mission is to make sure that it doesn't get lost because everyone's got those skills. Everyone's got a way of leading. Um, you can always get better at it. You can always learn some new ways. Like Severe and Aaron have said, there's no one person. I'm like, I want to be that person. I've collected bits along the way. Again, I said before Severe joined that I worked you know, with him, for him. Um, and it was very much that I worked with him because it was a very collaborative style of working. And that um, you know, I learned a lot from that and I, I continue to learn from the people I work with now. And I have people that inspire me all the time to be better at it. And sometimes you learn from the when when things don't go so well. Remember, we learn best from what we would perceive as failures. So it's probably better for us to continue to test ourselves. Um, so challenge yourself to try something different or new, whether you chair a meeting a different way or you decide to run a project a bit bit differently you've got to risk failure to get better at stuff and that's really hard because we don't want to do that with patients okay patient safety that's a different ball game but there are things that we need to learn and I think that's probably why doctors struggle a little bit with it because actually we want to do our absolute best and never fail our patients absolutely appropriately but actually for this stuff to make services better you've got to kind of play around a bit and it's that um, blend that makes you better at both actually um so that's what I've learned, that actually it's good to experiment and always do it with a load of people because it's way more fun. Yeah. I, I must, because um, uh, we've all got our own um, uh, people who to, and I, 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 you know, there are a couple for me um, who, uh, one was when I was a registrar, guys, and he was, um, he was the Dean of Education, he was a respiratory consultant, and he was so conscientious in the way he thought about every patient and you know i was a sort of um you know surely this must be the reason you know this is what we need to do and he would think about the pros and the cons and he would he was assimilating it and then he would ask you and then he would sort of change your view your your sort of sudden view of things or your your um uh system one way of thinking your heuristic way of thinking and and that was that was a a great influence on me to really think about the uh, both sides of the argument before uh, laying down what your judgment is and the other one was this ability to try and excite you know anyone it is around you by what you've what you've heard and that's someone that joe and i know for many years who passed away a few years ago who was at the brompton and and um, he was an extraordinary leader in so many ways he was humble but equally he could talk with um, you know, um, uh, the great and the good. Um, uh, but it was simple things like on the ward round, um, you know, what does everyone want to do today? And, uh, and you know, no one would know what the answer was. And he'd say, be on call. And then what is everyone thinking? Um, and everyone would look confused and say, diagnosis. You know, it's just those little quips and things that, will, that can lift the mood. Uh, and, and I think that those represent little nuggets of, uh, of leadership that can then, as Aaron said, influence others. Uh, so taking away all these things, little nuggets can actually um, uh, make you better and try to uh, engender uh, some of those things in others, you know. Uh, so, so uh, but it is a team sport, as Joe says, it, you know, you, um, you have to have people around you uh, to try and engage them. So it's, it's great learning every day i learn something new i really do and i think i'm more 
conscious of uh, of the things I don't know now. So if I if I've heard of something that I don't know, I will really I will look on the internet and actually absolutely just try and find out about it. So uh, there's growth all the time. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Singh. And I think with that, um, we have approached the end of our session. Um, so thank you, panel members, um, for sharing um, your experience with us, the things that you've learnt, uh, sharing your time with us. Um, it's interesting that at the end of the session, we've we sort of flipped leadership on its head, and we've come to to teamwork as being one of the essences of uh, of being a good leader. Um, and thank you for sharing uh, your perspective, which often we as trainees don't see, you know, looking at the organisations that we work for um, from the bottom up as opposed to, to from the top. Um, but thank you very much for that. Um, and just um, for anyone watching this, um, if people do want to connect with you, if they have any questions, how, how, how should they go about doing that? Yeah. So like a total addict, I'll just put a Twitter name in. I love Joe's. Uh, Joe's uh, Twitter things are absolutely fantastic. They're um, every day. It's, it's just it's, that's leadership. Um, I, I'm on I'm on Twitter, but I'm also on email, so anyone can get me through my Imperial or Brompton email. Um, TJ. Yes, thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, Aaron. Yeah, I'm on Twitter, but I barely use it to be honest. So um, best is on LinkedIn, and I think my handle is attached to my. Uh, if you click on my name on the side, I think it's on there. Um, so you can find me on there or um, my first name dot surname at booper.com. Cool. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, panel members. Uh, I hope you have uh, a good weekend, even though I can see that it's raining outside. Um, and I look forward to, to seeing you all um, soon. Thanks for having us. It's the longest yeah. show I've had with Severe for ages. I know. It's been, <laughs> it's been it's an absolute pleasure. It's been, uh, and it's been really, really great. And thank you so much, DJ, for bringing us together. So thank you. Uh, and so, someone asked in the questions whether you whether 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 you passed. Um, um, that was I mean, me. I, I was yeah, teasing Aaron. Aaron. <laughs> did, did Sophia pass you? This is all we need to know. Of course, yeah. he's, a, he's, a, he's a legend. He's a legend. <laughs> he's a legend. My, that's why. That's why he is where he is. <laughs> at, at Chelsea, I think it was. Yeah, I remember right. those. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Good. Thank cool. you so much. Thank you very much. Right. Great. Great facilitating. Well done.